next picture, just I want to take a moment and just just to share a thought with you. I, I don't know if you ever do this. Uh, maybe it's just me because you guys are Christians here. Uh, and, uh, but sometimes we the, the praise and worship just becomes like a stepping stone uh, to get to the end destination. You know, I'm talking about well, we come here for the preacher, we come here to hear the word and, uh, and, and the notices and the music and other stuff. That's just a fill in space. And so we spend uh, time in worship just maybe counting down the songs because we know when we get to the fourth song, we get to sit down again. Or, or you know, we're like, okay, that's two praise songs, two worship to go. Maybe we, maybe we just zone out and, and, and spend the time in, in worship just thinking about uh, what's going to be on the menu for the rest of the week and what we need to do for food shopping or with the things that are happening in our life, but why what, what don't we make a choice this morning that, that we make praise and worship the main thing? That, that, that we don't make it, uh, uh, that the preaching is the, the destination, but then there is a moment of praise and worship where we choose to connect with God. There is a moment where we're rather than thinking about our own thoughts, we say, hey God, why don't you let my thoughts be your thoughts? Like, God, God, why don't you fill my thoughts? God, why don't you speak to me? God, I want to hear from you. God, I, I want to connect with you. Come on, choose this morning. Let, let's choose to engage. Let's uh, choose not to just get disinterested. Let's, let's choose not to zone out, but let's choose to engage and to give him the praise and worship that he's worthy of. Come on, choose. We're going to worship this morning. We're going to sing a new song to, to Jesus. This is actually a song that, that's come out of us as a church. This is an Elam song uh, that Omega wrote, and it's... Uh, it's based on Isaiah 61. Come on, let's, just, let's make these words our words. Come on, let's make this our anthem. Let's, let's lift it up to him. Let's engage this person this morning. Let your freedom reign over my 
generosity of the people that are in our church because it's because because our church gives that we've got so many amazing ministries that we're so blessed with um not only on sunday but throughout the week and it's just so exciting for me to see our young people up front and praising and worshiping god and engaging and being in this house on a sunday morning you know if it wasn't for the generosity of our church we wouldn't be able to uh, we wouldn't be even be able to put on oxygen as a as a ministry and when we had some great moments on friday night I, this one moment i was sort of closing praise and worship and and I just got that nudge from the Holy Spirit, and I've been learning more and more just to trust the nudge and just to go for it. And I just said, hey, if there's anybody that, that, that is struggling with an injury, um, a sports-related injury, uh, why don't you come up? I'd love to pray for you to be healed. And, and all of a sudden, like, sort of, I think it was eight to ten people sort of came forward to the front, and, and we, we, just, we just prayed for them and prayed for God's healing. And, and a number were touched and, and, and physically felt God's presence. And uh, so exciting, so encouraging to see... Uh, our young people are experiencing the power of God in their lives. Uh, the reality of Jesus 
uh, for them and and that wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the generosity of our church and, and i just want to say thank you church for for all that you give and all you invest and all that and that you believe in us as a youth ministry that you believe in our young people uh we've got some exciting things happening following our our breakthrough vision offering uh and we're going to hear just for in, in just a second from pastor luke uh, about some exciting things that, that are going to be happening as a result of our offering so i'm just going to ask Ashley to come up and and take up the offering as i pray and we'll check out that clip God, we just thank you, God, that uh, you are so generous. God, I thank you that you believe in us, God, that you sow into us, that you invest in us, God, that you'll never give up on us. And God, I just pray that as we give, God, it would be a seed, God, planted into the next generation, God. It would be a seed that would bear much fruit, God, that would see the city and this nation changed and this world changed, God, in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Awesome church. Let's check out this clip. Soon will be one church that meets in five locations. And so we have a number of people that are moving out that way, and we want to establish a church there. Pastor Daryl and Denise Booth, uh, like Tim and Daryl, uh, they are going to head up this work, and uh, Pastor Daryl will tell you a little bit about it. Yeah, it's so exciting to be a part of Elam because we believe that we carry a message of hope. And that message of hope is that to go out there and, and cause breakthrough in people's lives and to change towns and cities for Jesus. So so it's really exciting for us to be able to establish that, to go and plant that there. So I just really ask him that you will pray for us, that you will support us. And if you know of people who live out there, or maybe they're out there already, family or friends or anybody, please let me know their details or their names and email addresses and things like that. I'd love to contact them and give them an invite. So church, please be praying for us. So pray for this new work. If you know somebody that lives out that way, contact Pastor Darrell. Maybe you're going to move out that way. Get in touch. You'll see his email on the screen below you. Again, thank you very much for your generous giving to us. It's pretty exciting, eh? Go from four campuses to five, and then maybe six and seven, and who knows? Maybe some some people here are carrying a gift, something that that may be needed in one of those places as well. So uh, we're excited about. Being a part of a, a church that's making such an impact right across our nation. Well, we're, we're in the middle of a series called Joy No Matter What. When you preach a series like this, I just find that God allows you to walk the sermon out. So, uh, if you've got a Bible with you this morning, I, I want to read a passage, get us started. And uh, God has uh, managed to take me through a couple moments where I had to choose joy no matter what this morning. So uh, in Philippians chapter 2, we're reading from the second chapter. This is a letter that Paul wrote to the, the church of Philippi. It says in Philippians 2, verses 1 through to 11, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mind set as Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What an incredible passage of scripture. 
this morning we get to look at. Would you pray with me as we begin? Father, we thank you that your word is indeed a light to our path, or a lamp to our feet. That as we read your word, it teaches us how we relate to you, how we, how we love you and serve you. Lord, it teaches us how we can relate to other people. And Lord, as we talk about joy again this morning, Lord, we want to make a decision. We choose to, to, to live a life of joy, to, to make decisions, Lord God, that would honor you, that would put you first and, and, and others second, Lord. And Lord, we, we want to be a people that are filled with the joy of the Lord, that would be our strength and everything we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, last week it was uh, Amy struggling with joy. This week it was me. Let me tell you a story. We, uh, we, we operate with a budget. I'll, I'll share a little bit of that in our communication sex and money. Every bit of our money is allocated. So it's allocated for food, for, uh, for clothing, uh, for savings. We even have put money aside if we want to give it an offering in a year. We, we put money aside so that we're able to do that. Uh, we've got spending money. We call it sanity money. This is money that you can spend um, at, at any time without any repercussions as long as you only spend that money. And so uh, we're committed to this, you know, every dollar is accounted for. Oh, who am I kidding? It doesn't really work that way. I wish it did, but not always. You see, um, we went down to our, our monthly meeting. So all the teams uh, from around the campus get together and we had our team meeting. So this was the first one that Amy went to. So uh, Amy's one that likes to celebrate milestones. So while I'm in a couple of other meetings, she sneaks in and, and says, oh, can I just borrow the keys? I said, yes. You know, and, and before I even got a chance to talk to her and ask her where she was going, she's gone like a thief in the night. Just <laughs> out of there. Later that night, out comes a confession. She says, hey, honey. And she usually says, hey, honey, with a smile on her face. I bought a couple of things. I'm like, with, with what money? You know, you know. She starts to show it off to me. And, you know, and ladies, you do that. You know, and it's like, I know it looks good. It does look good on you. But, but you know, she, she, she bought this pair of shoes. And, and it was, she saved so much money. And, and it's so convincing. I said, well, if you didn't spend it all, I could have saved even more. <laughs> However, I want to talk about Amy's Shopocalypse. one by one, the, the, the items, and even, you know, I saw the other day, I was like, wow, that's a new top two, that's awesome. <laughs> but Amy confessed to you uh, not that long ago that she likes to have her money where she can see it hanging in a wardrobe. <laughs> the reality of this is Amy's going to have to hang her boots on the curtain rods, because we can't afford curtains in our new house because of it. So when you come around to visit, you'll see these, these, these boots <laughs> hanging on the curtain rods, all right? <laughs> But you see, it gets even better than that. <laughs> Last night we went out and she's wearing her boots and um, a, a glass dropped on the ground um, with, with some Sprite in it and the Sprite splattered all over her, her new leather boots. Now, in some religions, you call it karma. <laughs> I just wonder if that's the judgment of God. <laughs> I'm teasing. Actually, the boots look great, though. They look fantastic. So. <laughs> It's all right. She gets her own back. She gets to preach in a few weeks. She can tell. She can tell a whole bunch of stories. But as you can see, even our, even your pastors don't agree on everything. And in this passage, we're we're hearing Paul talk about a thing called unity. What hope do we have of actually finding unity in a group of people that are so vastly different? If you were to talk with anybody in this room. You find some things in common, but there's so many things that are different. So many even views and opinions that are slightly different to each other. So how do we find this unity that Paul is talking about? This, this one mind, this, this one thought, this, this one purpose, one focus. Unity is such an important thing. And that's what we're talking about this morning. In this series, we, we talked last week about having joy in spite of our circumstances. Well, I had to live out that sermon on Thursday when I get the phone call from Amy. She's stuck at the lights just 50 metres down the road saying the car won't start. She parked at the lights and, you know, just parked right out. So I run down, we managed to, to turn it into the, the mechanics. And, uh, and fortunately, the mechanic had a solution. And $290 later, our car's fixed. 
I counted, I chose joy in spite of the circumstances that were ahead of me. So I'm not talking about unity in relationships. Guess what gets tested this week? My relationships. And I'm going to share a little story a little bit later on on that. But I want to pick up on this topic of unity this morning because it's such an important thing. And I want to say one thing, that serving others brings us the greatest joy. When we, when we understand that serving others actually brings the greatest joy, it may change our mindset in the way that we love and treat and serve other people. Sometimes it's hard to believe, I know, but people can sometimes rob us of our joy. You ever found that? Sometimes, just sometimes, other people can actually rob us of our joy. We're having a good day and then we bump into that person. And that person does something or says something that actually robs us of all of that joy. And yet Paul's saying, I want you to live in such a way that, that there's unity in everything that, that, that takes place. He's saying rather than uh, living in division, I want to see that unity. So there's probably, we, we would understand that there was probably a letter or some communication back to Paul saying that there was division in the church of Philippi. Normally the letters addressed something that was going on within, within the congregation, within the group of people. And so Paul's writing back and urging them to think about and consider and live a life of unity. So let's go into this first verse. We're going to go verse by verse through this passage this morning. Verse 1, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Last week we talked about that passage in, the, in Philippians chapter 1, the, the, the emphasis on you. you know, Paul was so excited about the you, the people in his life. He was so so passionate, and you know, his joy was filled with thinking about these people. In this passage, Paul says, you make my joy complete. If you read that in verse 1. Sure, um, if any tenderness, any compassion, then make my joy complete. How would, it, how would he, his joy be completed fully? By being like-minded. Being the same, having the same love. Being one in spirit and in mind. So he's saying, if you get unity, my joy is overflowing, it's complete. Do we have that unity in the relationships around us? Do we have that within, within our body of believers here? Do we, do we have it in our life groups? Do we have it in our business at, at work? Do we have it in our home? Do we have that, that unity that would make Paul's joy complete? These two verses, for me, sum up the rise and fall of any organization. Unity. You, you, you try leading a business, an organization where there's two different visions. Two visions is division, isn't it? So when you have one vision, when you have a common purpose, a common focus, a common goal, there is power. The greatest way to destroy any organization, any relationship, is to break up the unity. Unity is so powerful. But there's a big difference between some words that sound a little bit like unity. We have uniformity. We have union. But it's not the same as unity. Uniformity, basically, is the result of pressure around us. We see that in, in today's society. The uniformity of wanting to look like everybody else so that we can be unique. Work that one out. Fashion is, is, is it's, it's that way. You know, we, we, we want to look like everybody else. And you know, it's kind of like we just kind of pop out these gingerbread men. They all kind of look the same. You know, now, my theory is, I, I reckon you should just wear what you want to wear. Because if you wear it long enough, the fashion cycle will actually just come around. And, 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 and you'll, be, you'll be the hipster. I mean, you'll, you'll be setting the tree. You'll go, yeah. And, and like, hey, I, I was wearing that 16 years ago. I mean, I'm just, I'm just dying to, to pull out the baggy jeans again and uh, the denim shirt, and uh, Amy's not so excited about that. But uniformity isn't unity. Looking like and, and feeling like everybody else it isn't actually unity. Then we have union. A union is where we come together and we agree on some of the same things. We share some same things. I remember being a part of a union parish where we shared facilities. Was there unity? Not really. We were sharing facilities, but we didn't have the same vision going forward. Now, you can tie two cats together by their tails, 
throw them over a washing line, you've got the union. But how many people know you haven't got unity? And before you call me SPCA, I didn't try all that, okay? Just in case you're wondering. I actually do like cats. <laughs> See, unity is actually a heart thing. Unity is my heart connected to your heart, agreeing on the same thing. It's not pretending, it's not putting on a face, it's actually something that goes way deeper than looking or sharing together of, of resources. It's actually a heart thing that says we are on the same page in these things. He says that if you have anything, you're being united in Christ. See, unity starts with us being one in Christ. When we have a relationship with Jesus, we are then more likely to find unity with other believers because we become like Jesus. When we are like Jesus, we become like-minded if we are all like Jesus. Unity is a powerful thing. We talked about it last, last Sunday night, about the Tower, the, the tower of Babel. The people got together, they, they, they determined in their heart to build this incredible tower as a monument to themselves. God sees the unity and says if these people purpose in their heart to do this thing, nothing will be impossible for them. There's incredible power in unity from a, a non-godly sense, but how much greater in a godly sense. If we could agree on the right thing and the same thing, we could sing the same song. That's why I'm so excited about this, this project around Alpha, this, this strategy where we were all going to play our part so that some would come to Christ. Just talking with someone from another church, they're running Alpha as well. We've seen 50 people come to Christ through this Alpha course. They're down, in, down in East Howard, where they, I think they had 82 people come to the Alpha course. It is the one, one course right across the world where, where people knit into the heart of God because Jesus is central. But if we as one church, one congregation, one group of believers could agree on that one thing, sing that one song, what kind of an impact could we have on our community? I mean, we see five families, ten families, twenty families, love God, served, and I, I, I'm so excited. I, I, like I said Sunday night, I've never been more excited about being a part of a body of, of, of believers. I'm just so excited about what God is going to do when we actually sing that one song. And unity does that. Different people from different walks of life. Everybody in this room is different. And praise God for that. It would be horrible if you all wanted to try to be like me. Because I'm doing my part, and, and if you do your part, and we all do our part, the influence we have is far greater because we actually are touching the different people that God has placed us beside us. If we don't have unity, then there's generally a spiritual problem. Because it's a heart thing. If we don't have unity, then there's, there's division in, in, in our spiritual relationship with other people. And that's what we've got to pray for. That's what we've got to believe for. That's what we've got to contend for, that unity. So this is where Paul goes on in verse 3. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. The root of all man's sin is selfishness. It's being self-centered, being focused on me rather than on other people. The cause of selfishness is pride, isn't it? When we read in Isaiah and Ezekiel about the devil, he fell because of pride. He saw the worship and the adoration that was being given to God, and as an angel, he said, I want that for myself. It was like he stepped in to receive the glory for himself. That's pride. That caused division. See, God doesn't tolerate division, does he? It happened like lightning. That's how it's described. Poof. The devil was cast down like lightning. Unity is a big thing for God. There can be no joy in the life of the Christian who puts himself above others. Verse 4, it goes on and says, Rather in humility, humility, me lowering myself, choosing to think less of myself than somebody else. In humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Choosing to look to others' needs rather than your own doesn't make you a religious doorman. We need to understand this. Sometimes we, we, we think that if, if we kind of put others' needs first, then they'll, they'll trample over us. Look at Jesus. Was he a doormat? 
Not at all. But he lived his life serving others. And we're going to get to that at the end of this passage. doesn't mean that you have to give in to everybody else's wishes and needs. But what it does mean is that you're always thinking about somebody else. In every conversation that you're having, are you going, am I in this for me, what I can get out of it? Or am I in this because I want to bless someone? I want to love someone? I want to serve someone? And this is what happens, and I, I shared on Sunday night. If, if we all are committed to loving somebody else, seeking their needs greater than our own, in the community of believers, all of our needs will be met too. Because somebody else will be thinking about you more than they are themselves. So if I make a commitment to think about other people more than myself, I'm taking the first step. If all of you, which I see, I hear the testimony of love and generosity and extravagance as you love on other people, guess what? All of our needs within our community get met. I shared in our Communication, Sex and Money series that early on in our relationship, I, I used my words to effectively destroy Amy. I could win any argument, even when I knew I was wrong. I could kind of just throw weird logic in there and just confuse Amy and, and convince her that I was right. And I didn't realize that my words were actually tearing her apart. I, 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 was, I was hurting her far deeper than, than, than probably any physical abuse in that sense. You know, I, I, was, I, I was just tearing away her confidence. And until we actually addressed it, until she had shared what was actually going on, I didn't realize what I was doing. Because I put my needs, my selfishness above her needs. So it's a choice that we've got to make. Serving others is our greatest joy, but it's a, but it's a step that we've got to take. See, when Paul talked about considering others' needs greater than his own, I believe it's a game changer. It changes our community when we're actually thinking about other people rather than ourselves. I love seeing our team win. We have got a phenomenal leadership team, staff and volunteers, and an incredible church here. Just doing amazing things, you know, in, in the week, throughout the week, and on a Sunday. It, I, and I love seeing people win. I, I, I love sowing into and believing in somebody. I, I love watching them Kind of tackle the hard conversations and the tough decisions and, 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 and get a win. And, and if we can have that attitude that we want to see other people win wherever we are, in our businesses, in our homes, in our schools, in, the, in, the, in, the, in our sports teams, if we can believe in other people and actually hope that they win, guess what? We all win. See, if, if you win, I win. We win together as a group. Uh, when our projector blew Midweek, you, you can tell there's no projector, and you're going, what, what's happened? Well, it's uh, given up its life. It's, uh, it said, enough is enough, and it's gone. So, gone. <laughs> Ain't coming back. Ten years, it served us well. Moment of silence for our projector. <laughs> we are getting a new one. But you know what? One of our team, one of our team said, so we could have a projector on Sunday. I'm prepared to come in during the week, take the projector down, put one up to you temporarily, and uh, it would probably have taken them five to six hours to do that. You know what I said? I said, we can look after life. We, we can handle it for this week. You know, we will get a projector. But it doesn't matter, really, because it's, it's not about a performance. It's not, a, you know, I, I love the excellence about this church. I, I do, and we will always strive for it because I think when we present Jesus in a great way, it, it, it makes, it, it, it just adds to the the, the value of who God is. But we're not going to put excellence over people. We're not going to put performance or, or, or presentation over relationships. And you know, sometimes, you know, are we doing okay without a projector this morning? I think we are. Will we get a projector? Yes, we will. So don't worry about it. It's, it's coming. But I think sometimes we've got to make sure that people stay the focus. You know, that, 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 that unity and, you know, and that, that person is all in. That they said, I'll do it. I'll come in. I said, I know you will, which is why I'm saying no. Because I didn't want them to give up that time that they could have been with their family. Because I believe in us collectively as a, as a family. But you know what? I messed up this week. I did. A good friend in this church. 
I, I, I did something that I didn't even realize I had done initially. Fortunately, they came. They spoke to me about it. They said they were really hurt. And when I heard what they said and what, what happened, I was, I was pretty gutted in the way that I'd, I'd reacted. And I had a choice. Pull the pastor card. Hey, I'm the boss. Whatever. You know what I said? I said, I'm so sorry. I missed that. Will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? They said, yes. I made it right. <coughs> Unity back again. You know what the enemy would like to do more than anything else? Is get in, break up what God is doing in this place. There is something supernatural happening in our midst. And I, I don't know, I mean, I've been in church a long time, and I'll say it again. The only people that get to mess this up and see people not come to Christ is us. If we mess it up, if I mess it up, if we together mess it up, and the best way we can do it is to keep short accounts with each other. Keep talking, keep having the conversation. If something's not going right, we seek clarification. We, we, we build that relationship so that we can have the greatest possible chance of reaching our city for Jesus. And that happens when we are united. Unity is love, it's forgiveness. A choice that says, I want you to win. Because if you win, I win. We win. First four verses we've read are, are a plea from Paul to say, come on, just be united in these things. In, in your mind, in your thought, in your, in your spirit. Let's have that one one unity going on. And then he reminds the people of Philippi about the greatest example of humility, the greatest result of unity, and that's the relationship between God the Father and Jesus Christ. So it's a refo he's focused on people, and then all of a sudden, in verse 5, he shifts to the relationship, be like Christ. Listen to this passage. In your relationship with one another. So the way we treat one another, he's saying, now think about the way Jesus lived his life. And this is how we achieve unity. This is how we achieve that heart to serve. Listen to verse 5. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. It's kind of hard for us to really grasp this concept. But God gave up, Jesus gave up, the, the, the privileges of being God come to earth. The, the only way we can possibly kind of understand it in a human sense is if the queen, the monarch, would, would give up her rights, all of her rights, all of her wealth, all of her riches, and become a commoner. And actually give it all away. No longer having the power and the authority to, to call upon the guards or the authority of the land. And, you know, just to be one of us. Now that's a very weak um, interpretation of what Jesus did, but, but to put it in our minds, that, that's what it would be like. Jesus gave up all of those rights, didn't consider his, 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 his relationship with God as something to be taken advantage of. He gave it all up. And what did he do? He served. He loved people. The word others is a key word in Scripture. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11 says, therefore encourage one another, build each other up. Galatians 6 verse 2, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. In the New Testament, 20 times we're encouraged in some shape or form to consider others, to build into others, to encourage others. The focus is not on ourselves, it's on other people. In verse 7, it goes on and it says, Rather, he, Jesus, made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Jesus didn't pretend to be a servant, didn't put on a face, didn't act, didn't put on a show. He became a servant. He actually made that decision. Because you know, sometimes we can put on a show. But we can try and impress somebody by going, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll help and I'll serve. And, but he did. He, he, he lived his life to serve. We read that in Matthew 20, verse 28. He says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And when you look at the life of Jesus, what did he do? He went and healed the broken. He, he went and fed, the, fed those that were hungry. He was there pretty much at the beck and call of anyone who needed him. And he loved 
and he served, and he, he, he spent long days and long nights loving and serving others. In fact, the disciples are having this big conversation, who's the greatest? Who's going to sit beside God when it's all wrapped up? And they're having this conversation about who gets to be the greatest. Jesus takes the towel and he wraps it around his waist. And he goes and washes the feet of his disciples. He takes the lowest job in the house. You know, they're, they're walking in sandals, dust and the dirt, the, the, the filth, the excrement that was probably on the ground as they walked through the day. They get in at the end of the day and the servant, the slave, would wash the feet. Couldn't wash your own. Wouldn't want to do that, would you? And Jesus did that. He took the towel around and washed the feet of his disciples. He came to serve. That's the heart of Christ. And he's saying, this is the way we treat one another. You know, we're not, don't worry, we're not going to have a foot washing ceremony. Okay? Trust me. <laughs> we don't want to do that. But you know what? Sometimes God asks us to do something to serve someone. What's our response? Our response should be wholeheartedly yes. Yes, I respond in that way. I've found the happiest people in life are servants. Grumpiest people are those that it's all about them. The happiest people, the people that have the most joy in their life, are people that have learned that the greatest joy comes from serving. And I love that I don't get to preach it. Honestly, you guys get it. You guys have got it. You understand it. And, and, and this is an encouragement that there's such a heart to serve. I love praying every Sunday morning, 9.15, with the team that's about to come out and love on you guys. It's such a joy and a privilege to hear their hearts. I want to love, I want to serve, I want to bless somebody. But it doesn't just happen here on a Sunday. It goes out into the various ministries. Go down into, into your world, into your where you go to your boss and say, is there anything else I can do for you before I go home? As the boss, serving the needs of those that you are over, having that heart to serve and love on others changes the world around us. Serving others brings our greatest joy. You know, the roots of true happiness grow in the soil of service. Incredible thought, isn't it? The roots of true happiness grow in the soil of service. You want to find joy? Serve someone else. Serve someone else. I am enjoying the greatest season of my life in ministry and leadership. Why? Because I get to serve someone else's vision. I had seven years of being able to have my own vision. And you know what? I'm just loving this even more. I'm loving the fact that Pastor Luke and Marilyn have got a vision and the elders have got a vision for our church and the campuses. And I love serving that vision. I'm so excited about what God's going to do as we all come under that vision with that one strategy, singing that one song to reach and serve and influence into our community. All Christian ministry begins by being servant. I don't know many people that come straight out of school and get offered a CEO role. Yeah? You work your way through the company. How do you do it? You work hard. You serve. You serve, you serve, you serve, you serve. Somebody goes, I like your attitude. You're hard working. You're going you're gonna to step up into this next role, and then this next role, and then this next role. And that happens with a heart to serve. Not for the promotion, but because that's our heart attitude that we want to serve others. We're given three examples of those who learn to serve in the latter part of the chapter. So if you go to the last part, and we won't get there today, but verse 17, verse 20, 22, verse 30, it talks about uh, Paul. He talks about his servant heart. Uh, verse 20 and 22, it talks about Timothy, the way that he served, and as a result of that, found that next level of leadership. Epaphrodites, in verse 30, Paul says, he risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. For Epaphrodites, he, he found his way kind of in, in the gap to love and serve the congregation. So we're kind of wrapping up this passage in, in verse 8. This is what Jesus says, Paul says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You want to hear the heart of servanthood? It's Jesus giving everything for us. He became obedient even to death, even though he had become death, defeated death. He 
became obedient to that because he knew that he had to die so that we could have life. Ministry that, that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. It doesn't cost us something that often doesn't result in anything. It took sacrifice to bring us salvation. And guess what? Jesus counted as joy. Let's listen to this in Hebrews verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 2. Maybe I can just get the worship team to come here. It says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What was his joy? His joy was you, his joy was me, finding hope and forgiveness in his Father. So for you, he counted it joy to go to the cross. For me, he counted it joy. That is how much God loves us. So much that he'd give his only son so that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. That is the joy that Jesus lived for so that we can have a relationship with God. Maybe you're here today and you haven't received the salvation, the forgiveness from God. It's here. It's available right here, right now. And a response in our hearts, a confession of our mouth, we can receive that forgiveness. And right now, as with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to give that opportunity. If you've never asked Christ to be your Lord and Savior, to forgive you for the sins that separated you from God, today, you can. With a simple acknowledgement, God, I've sinned. I've messed up, I've fallen short of that that standard of holiness. And I acknowledge it, recognize that I've been wrong. I confess that today, I repent, I I turn from that, I choose to follow you. If that's you today, you say, I know I need to get my life right with God. Maybe you've been away from God for some time, and you're returning back. For whatever reason, God's brought you back here. You walk through these doors, you're not even sure what's going on. But there's a sense that you've got to get your life right with God. It happens by receiving the sacrifice that Jesus made for our salvation. I'm going to pray a prayer. Would you, would you pray a prayer with me? Do you believe that? If, 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 you, if you want to see that relationship with God made right, the Bible says that in that confession, in that belief in your heart, you would find salvation. Let's pray that this morning. Lord Jesus, you gave the ultimate example of service when you laid down your life for me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for making a way for me to be right with God. I've sinned. I've been in the wrong. I've I've lived life selfishly. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. I want to be in a relationship with you. I repent. I turn from the sinful way of living. And I choose your way to be Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. With every head bowed, eye closed. If, if you prayed that prayer, we want to help you on the journey. We, we want to help you get on to that next step of following Jesus. Without embarrassing you, we just want to know who's prayed this prayer. One of our team will, will, will just get alongside you and uh, start that journey with you. But would you just raise your hand and say, that's me. Yeah, I've prayed that prayer. I want to make my, my life right with God. Anyone here this morning saying, yeah, I'm coming to God for the first time or maybe returning back to Him? Anyone this morning? Thank you. That's a great prayer. That's awesome. Just hold your hand up. Anyone else this morning? Making your life right with God? That's the joy Jesus was talking about. <laughs> That's the joy Jesus was talking about. Lives coming to Christ. Lives coming back in relationship with God. You can look at me in the church. I want to read verses 9 to 11 as we close. Therefore, God exalted Jesus to the highest place. He gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord.
the glory of God the Father. That is our good news. That is our good news. Jesus went to the cross. He died, but he was resurrected, returned. He now sits at the right hand of the Father. He will return one day. He's going to wrap this whole thing up. We get to go and be with him. If we have received him. And if you haven't, you can. If you pray that prayer, connect with somebody. Maybe you came with them. And let's believe that you're going to walk that journey. But the greatest joy that we can have is when we serve others. So as we sing, we're going to sing the song Spirit one more time. Would our voices unite with one prayer? That there would be a, a unity in the voice of Elon Christian Center North to go reach, serve, and influence our community for Jesus. Press 15, it says, So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. How true is that right now? Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. I want to be star shining. Like my boy loves seeing the stars. Any chance he can at night, he goes, Daddy, the stars in the sky. He just looks up and he's amazed at the stars in the sky. Why don't we stand, church? We're going to sing the song together. Wouldn't you want to be a star that shines brightly into this, this generation, into the darkness that is all around us, that we would be lights in the darkness that comes as we make a choice to love and serve other people? Come on, with one voice together, let's sing. Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Spirit of the Lord makes my heart sing. Let your freedom reign around me, my God. You say. you get into one best thing that you can do. Uh, we've got a great service next week again with the next part of our series, Joy, uh, no matter what. So find someone, grab an invite card, invite them to church, and, and don't forget to be a center of hope to reach and influence our community. Bless your church, go to the cafe, have a coffee. It's going to be a great time.